My dearly beloved in Christ, as we reflect upon this wonderful gospel story of three chosen apostles, Peter, James, and John, who were privileged to witness what we call the transfiguration. Our Lord's garments became white as snow. His face shone like the sun. And you can imagine what their thoughts were. Peter, James, and John, they must have thought, what a privilege for us. Our Lord chose us from among the 12 apostles to witness this vision. Not everyone of the apostles. So they were, they were specially honored, specially chosen. And we could say to ourselves, we could ask ourselves the question, as we might be tempted with a holy envy, to envy their privilege, their lot, we might ask ourselves, who are the chosen ones now? Who are those that are selected out of other fellow Catholics and privileged more than their peers? And certainly that would be priests and religious. We could say that priests and religious are the intimates of our Lord. They are his own close companions as the apostles were and especially as the these three chosen apostles were. So it is good for us to reflect upon what the church teaches regarding vocation and to remind ourselves that we all should pray for vocations. And young people who have not yet chosen a state of life must pray every day that God will guide them to choose his will because God has a plan for each of us. And our desire should be to know, to find out, and then to fulfill God's will for us. Now, theologians tell us that there are two kinds of vocation, we might say, as far as one choosing the state of perfection, giving his life to God. There is, first of all, the general vocation, which is given to everyone. Because our Lord said, If thou wilt be perfect, go sell all thou hast and give to the poor, and come follow me, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. And that's, a, that's an invitation he gives to everyone. So anyone who wishes could pray for the grace, could choose that state of perfection and pray for the grace to fulfill it and live it and follow our Lord. And we find in the Middle Ages that Europe was covered with monasteries. So many men and women who would leave the world and live a life of consecration to God. Ireland in particular, after the preaching of St. Patrick, became known as the Isle of Saints and Scholars because there were so many who left the world to become religious. Because the general vocation, again, is given to everyone by our Lord. But the second is what we might call a special vocation or a particular vocation. And that is where our Lord, our Lord draws an individual through special graces he might give that person. And it can come in many ways. It can be a boy serving Mass, being close to the priest at the altar, and thinking, I want to do that. I want to become a priest. It can be a boy or girl receiving our Lord in Holy Communion and through Holy Communion feeling drawn to give his or her life to God. It can be someone who just through reflecting upon the corruption of the world, realizes the danger of saving one's soul in the world and thinking, I want to more securely save my soul, and thus choosing the religious life. But the, again, there are those who are given a special grace that our Lord calls particularly to follow him. We recall our Lord going by the Sea of Galilee and calling those first apostles who were fishermen, come, follow me. And it says in the gospel, they left their nets and they followed him. They just simply left their life and followed our Lord from that point on. So the word vocation means a call. It comes from the Latin word a call. But we must not misunderstand and think that those who have vocations have some kind of extraordinary experience, like they literally hear the voice of God or have some kind of a miraculous manifestation of his will. 
although that has happened in the lives of some of the saints. This Tuesday, we celebrate the feast of St. Gabriel of Our Lady of Sorrows, who, was a, who became a passionist religion, religious in the 1800s, mid-1800s, and died at a young age. And he was gifted with a unique call, circumstances where he became very ill and then prayed for a cure. He was at the point of death and promised that he would give his life to God and so forth. But that's not the case with everyone. And you might say that every single religious had a different experience of what made him or her come to the realization, God is calling me to follow him. And they followed that call. So we must not, again, think that because our experience wasn't like someone else. Well, God isn't calling me because I didn't have that experience that I read about in this book or that I heard from this religious. Each vocation is unique. So there is, again, that special call. And it is important for those who have it to follow our Lord, to accept that call. Because if our Lord plans for a boy or girl to serve him as a religious, that means that in the religious state, he's going to give the special graces that he has destined for that individual in that state. And if they reject that vocation and they choose a vocation in the lay state, maybe they will not have the graces that our Lord had destined for them in the religious state. So it is important for young people to pray for the grace to know God's will and also to pray for the grace to embrace it, to do God's holy will. St. Thomas Aquinas says that God always provides for his church adequate vocations, meaning the call, and is necessary for that to be, uh, to, to be corresponded with. So that God will always provide vocations. And certainly we need more vocations today. And so we need to pray that those young people to whom God is giving that call, that they will embrace it. And young people should not be afraid of the call of our Lord. Yes, it means renunciation. It means giving up material things and giving up your independence and giving up an opportunity to have your own family. There's the three vows. Poverty, obedience, submitting to an authority, and chastity, celibacy. It means giving up what you could have in the world and doing it for the love of God. And so there is that difficulty, that sacrifice that is involved. And we must always remember that God repays abundantly those who sacrifice for love of him. Now, I was saying earlier about this idea that we must not expect some kind of a miraculous manifestation of our Lord insofar as the call is concerned. In this regard, theologians speak about two different kinds of calls. There's an internal call and there's an external call of vocation. The internal would be an attraction to the religious life. And those who have the special vocation over and above the general call, which is given to everyone, there is some, some kind of an internal attraction or desire to serve God. But that is not necessarily a sure proof that that person has been given that vocation. The, the real proof is the external vocation, and that is where the superiors, it will be the bishop ordaining a priest, the superiors who witness um, a religious going through the early stages. Someone may want to serve God, and the superior says, you don't have a vocation. And that's, again, the external call is necessary. So an example of that would be St. Benedict Joseph Labray a very interesting saint from France of the mid-1700s, and he wanted very badly, very pious man, young man, and he wanted very badly to become a monk. And he entered the Trappist order, the most strict order. And he was there for a few months, and the superiors told him to leave. And then he came back later, six months, nine months later, wanted to try again, and this time he lasted a little longer. And the superiors told him, you don't have a vocation. 
you should return to the lay state. And why did they say that? Because he had a difficult time adapting to community life. So he did not have a religious vocation, even though he wanted to serve God. So what did he do? He started to go on pilgrimages. He spent a number of years and he visited the main shrines in Europe. And then he ended up in Rome and spent the last part of his life in Rome. He was called the saint of the 40 hours because he went to whatever church the blessed sacrament was exposed and knelt there for hours. So he just was peculiar, we might say, was unique. And he could not adapt to common life. So he did not have a vocation to the religious life. He had a vocation to serve God, and he did in a very unique way, but he did not have a vocation to the common life, the normal religious life. So that's what we mean by the external call. You might have a young man that enters a seminary, wants to be a priest, and he's there for a while, and the rector of the seminary or the bishop says, it's not God's will for you to be a priest. That's the, that's the external call. Now, how does a young person know that he or she, again, has this call from God? Well, there are four requirements to become a priest or religious. First of all, reasonably good health. Someone had very bad health, he or she could not become a religious because that person would be a burden to the community, wouldn't be able to keep up with the common life. Second, at least ordinary talents at least average intelligence and the ability to learn what is necessary. Third, reasonable independence. Now, if someone is loaded with a great deal of debt, he would have to resolve that debt before he could become uh, enter a religious house or a seminary. Also, reasonable independence would mean that one's parents were not dependent on him or her. If one's parents were elderly or ill and had no one else to take care of them, then that son or daughter would first have to provide for the parents. And then lastly, at least average piety. Someone who has a, a love for prayer and the spiritual life. At least an average piety. So those would be the four basic requirements. Now, when we speak about piety, it's important to keep in mind that, and there can be a tendency on the part of lay people to judge, oh, I think this one is being called to be a nun or a priest or brother. Sometimes you could have a young person that is very pious and takes to, to prayer, loves to pray. That doesn't necessarily mean that that boy or girl has that special vocation to the religious state because we need good, pious and solid Catholic lay men and lay women as well. And we look at the parents, for example, of the little flower, St. Teresa of the Child Jesus, how upstanding and devout and pious they were, and they raised a wonderful family. So we can't necessarily judge who has a vocation just by externals. And let's take the opposite case. I mentioned St. Gabriel of Our Lady of Sorrows. He was such a handful for his father that his father almost despaired. What is going to become of this boy, he would say, because he was so full of life and mischief and was a, just a problem for his father. And there he became a religious and a saint. So we, cannot, we have to be careful of human judgment. What we need to do is, again, pray for vocations because the church needs more vocations. We think about how many souls need the sacraments, how many souls could be reached if there were more priests and more religious, and the importance of Catholic schools and having religious sisters to teach the children in the school. So vocations are important for all of us. If you are married, you shouldn't be thinking during the sermon, well, I don't really need to pay much attention because I'm already in my vocation. Well, especially young parents, what about your children? Do you pray for vocations among your children? Good Catholic parents pray for that intention, and they realize that no greater blessing can come to their family than if God were to choose one or more of their, of their children to give their lives to him. And that would bring 
great honor and many blessings to the family. So vocations concern all of us. Certainly, lay people have to be concerned about who will be there to give me the sacraments, especially when I come to the end of my life. So we need priests. We need more priests and so forth. So we all must pray for vocations. Now, let me give you a few quotations from saints regarding vocations. This is St. John Chrysostom. If we knew that a place was unhealthy and subject to pestilence, would we not withdraw our children from it without being stopped by the riches that they might heap up in it or by the fact that their health had not as yet suffered? So he's saying the world. Parents should be happy if their children want to leave the world and enter religion. And St. John Chrysostom goes on, Many among seculars, shipwrecks, spiritually he's speaking about, shipwrecks are more frequent and sudden because the difficulties of navigation are greater. But with religious, storms are less violent, the calm is almost undisturbed. This is why we seek to draw as many as we can to the religious life. And here's another doctor of the church, St. Jerome, writing to a young man. I invite you, make haste. You have made light of my entreaties. Perhaps you will listen to my reproaches. Cowardly soldier, why are you still living with your parents? Though your mother tear her hair and rend her garments, though your father stand on the threshold and forbid your departure, you must be deaf to the voice of nature and hasten with unmoistened eye to enlist under the banner of Christ. Love for God and fear of hell easily breaks all chains. So obviously this was a case of a young man who was being called by God to the religious life and his parents were opposed to that. Uh, here is St. Augustine. I have been passionately fond of the perfection of the evangelical councils. With God's grace, I have embraced them. With all the power, I have, I have exhorted others to do the same. And I have companions whom I have succeeded in persuading. And finally, one more quote. This is St. Bernard of Clairvaux. Comparing religious to the people in the world, he says, Religious live more purely, they fall more rarely, they rise more speedily, they are aided more powerfully, they live more peacefully, they die more securely, and they are rewarded more abundantly. So, in conclusion, let us pray for vocations. Let us pray for our young people that they will choose the state that God is calling them to. And parents to pray for vocations among their children. We think about this gospel. We think about how blessed Peter, James, and John were to be chosen by our Lord to see this vision. Well, religious and priests are the intimates of our Lord. And should we not desire that more of our parishioners would hear that voice, follow that call, and give their lives to our Lord and be his chosen companions? Let us all pray for that intention and also pray for religious and priests that they will sanctify themselves and persevere in their vocation because by them living their vocation, we all benefit. We all benefit from the priests, the religious. So pray for more vocations and pray that those who have followed it will persevere and sanctify themselves in it. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, amen.